we haven't solved the problem that America has always dealt with. So you hear President Donald Trump talk about America's fighting an invisible enemy with the coronavirus and trying to find a cure or a vaccine, but America has never dealt with the original invisible enemy, which is white supremacy. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams, coming to you from Southern California. I write a legal blog named May It Please the Court and have a book out titled The Sled. Before we introduce today's topic, we'd like to take this time to thank our sponsor, Blue Jay Legal. Blue Jay Legal AI-powered foresight platforms accurately predict court outcomes and accelerate case research by using factors instead of keywords. You can learn more at bluejlegal.com. That's blue, the letter J, legal.com, bluejlegal.com. On February 23, 2020, Ahmad Aubrey, a 25-year-old African-American man, was gunned down while jogging through a Brunswick, Georgia neighborhood, just steps from his home. Two white men, Gregory McDaniel, a former officer with the Clinton County Police Department, and his son, Travis McMichael, told police they followed Aubrey in their pickup truck, believing he was responsible for a series of burglaries in the neighborhood. Gregory claimed Ahmad attacked his son, who then fired his weapon in self-defense, killing Aubrey. There were no arrests at the scene, and no charges were filed by prosecutors immediately. Some two months later, a video of the killing taken by William Roddy Bryan surfaced. The video contradicted the McMichael's account of what happened and led to a public outcry calling for justice for Ahmad. On Thursday, May 7th, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation charged the McMichaels with murder and aggravated assault. Today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to be discussing the killing of Maud Aubrey. We'll take a look at the laws of Georgia, the handling of his case by prosecutors, the impact of the video, where this matter stands today with state prosecutors, and what's going to be coming in the future. To do that, we've got a great show for you today. Our guest is attorney Christopher Bruce. He is the political director for the ACLU of Georgia. Chris has been the leader in a fight for civil rights, liberties across the state and the country. Welcome to our show, Chris. Uh, Thank you so much for having me, especially on this important topic. So much so, yes. And just to start us off, let's get a little bit of more background and uh, context, a little bit of a timeline, perhaps, of what the circumstances are that are going to form our discussion today. So I I think your timeline of events is exactly uh, the way that I will portray it. There are other things I will add into this, which is what we're calling for the resignation of the district attorney, Jackie Johnson, and the resignation of the district attorney, Barnhill, for impropriety and loss of trust by the community. We're echoing the sentiments of the people of Brunswick and Glen County and others in that area that is under that jurisdiction for their mishandling of this situation and the case. To clarify and put this in perspective, February 23rd, 2020 was when this killing happened, like you said before. And then May 7th, these individuals were in handcuffs. That's 74 days that these people were out in the community after committing murder. May 5th was when the Georgia Bureau of Investigations was called out to say, we would like you to investigate this case, which is the proper procedure. As I understand it, the GBI cannot go in unless a jurisdiction asks them to come and investigate. So they receive the file on May 6th, they go through the file, on May 7th, these people are in handcuffs. That's a far cry of what happened on February 23rd. And after going through three different district attorneys and no arrests being made, I have to commend the Georgia Bureau of Investigations of actually doing their job to uphold justice. But now it's like one of those type of things of when you see a light switch go on, you expect it to happen. When you see your TV turn on, you expect it to happen. When you see a murder in the street, you expect people to be arrested for it. And that's the problem. So that's why we're not praising the GBI for doing their job. They need to do their job. And now we're trying to make sure that justice is done in this case. Well, Chris, let's talk about those prosecutors. You know, there were, as you said, there were three. From what I've read, two of them said that they had some kind of a connection with the gentlemen that are charged, if you want to call them that, the two men that are charged. 
And so they recuse themselves. But it sounds to me 74 days is an awful lot of time for that kind of stuff to happen. And then there's the question of what one of those prosecutors wrote that the the uh, victim was responsible for the problem. What What's the background there? So you're going to have different stories based off of what you said. I'm sure this isn't anything new. On February 23rd, it seems the police, while they were questioning the two suspects, they had called up the district attorney's office and they got in touch with two district attorneys. That's not the dispute. They, we know that there was a call by the Glenn County Police Department to Jackie's uh, district attorney Johnson's prosecutorial department. And the, the disparity comes in where the police officers are saying that they were told not to arrest these individuals compared to the district attorney's office of saying they never gave such an order. And that's where the problem arises. And then the second part, the district attorney, Barnhill, he gets the case and he issues an opinion about the case of why these individuals who should be arrested were not arrested and then recuses himself as well. So this is why I think a Department of Justice investigation is proper in this situation, as well as a state organization like the GBI to look into the misdealings by these two district attorneys. So are the police also going to be investigated? Because isn't it the responsibility of the police themselves to make the decision to arrest or not to arrest and then to ref- whether to refer it to a DA? Right. So I'm going to let you in on a little breaking news. Yes, we are signing on to a letter of asking the Department of Justice to do an overall review of everything that has happened in this case, including the police. Uh, One of the things that the ACLU of Georgia is doing is talking to people on the ground. In fact, I'm going back out there tomorrow to have discussions with them regarding, not to go too deep into it, making a citizen's review board so they can look into police actions and they can have another type of grievance against them and another check on the police to make sure something like this doesn't happen again. Because that's what we're concerned about, making sure that something like this does not happen again. Exactly. Now, there are some circumstances that have shown up in video later that shows the home that was in con- under construction and mm-hmm. a gentleman who has a white T-shirt and appears to be. What's, what's the circumstances with that? So you hear different stories from different people again, of course, but it seems that the video shows a gentleman walking into on someone else's property and is uh, just looking around and then just leaves. It doesn't say anything regarding he took anything, he destroyed or... At most, there's a trespass, right? I mean, at most, there's a trespass. So there, that's where we're actually looking into this. And I may be out of date on this, but I remember when I was a third year in law school and I was doing my internship at a prosecutor, prosecutor's office, and I had a case where an individual was arrested for trespassing. The person that I reported to, I said, okay, well, let's just offer him pretrial diversion. And she said, drop the case. I said, drop the case? Why are you saying that? She said, did, is there anything in the police report about the owner of the property telling him to get off? I said, no. And then we looked up Georgia law. It says that you have to be told to leave the property or the premises by the owner or somebody who is authorized by the owner. And that was one of the first cases I was ever able to get an all across. I'm glad for that issue. So I'm looking back into the code itself. Even if there was an instance, if the owner is not telling you to get off your property, you don't have to get off the property at the time. And there was no harm. No harm. Now let's talk about this claim of self-defense. I mean, what you see in the video is Aubrey circling to the right around a pickup, and then it's blocked. The view of him and and, uh, apparently McMichaels is blocked. And then you see the two struggle in very Uh grainy video and what appears to be a gun, and you hear a couple of shots. It's it's not clear to the layman, I think, whether there's a claim of self-defense here that's valid, whether there's not, what the circumstances, who pulled the trigger, where the gun was pointed. I mean, there's what do you see, or what is the position of the ACLU about the video? So I'm glad you brought that up. And that I'll circle it back around to your previous question of Georgia citizens' arrest statute allows a private citizen to arrest someone if they, if a person has 
personal knowledge in their presence that something of a crime had happened. We don't know. And the people who were watching Mr. Ahmad did not know that a crime had actually happened at this time. And that's one of the reasons why we want to get rid of the Georgia citizens arrest statute altogether, because private citizens empower themselves to become vigilantes and try to confront others within this. Well, it's a little bit more than a private citizen. This is a retired policeman. Who is a private citizen. And we might be going over semantics. No, but I mean in the sense of in the common tort knowledge that a person with higher levels of training has a higher degree of responsibility. I agree. Completely agree. And they should act within that way, right? Right. I, I think we're dealing with messaging. So I'm very careful because the public sometimes gets confused within that. He should be charged as a private citizen. So when it comes down to grand jury investigations, police officers in the state of Georgia are allowed to have counsel during grand jury hearings and submit evidence as well. The private citizen does not. So that's, that's one of the things where I'm trying to make sure that the right procedures of process, due process are done. Well, this has already been, it's this already been charged. So they've bypassed the, you know, there was some, there was some noise about a grand jury proceeding, I think when it was right. in the county prosecutor's hands, but now that it's been in the state prosecutor's hands, they just bypassed the grand jury. And as you said, a day later, charged it. Exactly, which is what should have happened in the first place. Let's talk about the video. I mean, here you've got okay. uh, Mr. Bri- Mr. Brian, who I'm not sure how the video got leaked, but does he bear some culpability in this? Because there's also been some rumors or some statements out there that that this was a coordinated work between the two of them. One was following, one leapt ahead, and they and this is why the video was being taken. I don't I don't actually know what the circumstances are. We don't know either because what it looks like is almost similar to a lynch mob, right? Some people are saying, hey, we're going to go track this person down. And then, hey, you need to come along with us. And this individual decides on video as well. So I, I call on a full investigation of this individual as well to see if he's actually culpable within it. I don't want him to be able to get off of saying, well, I was just following and I had absolutely nothing to do with it because typically, People don't just follow after other people when they see that they're trying to chase down someone and arrest them. They're typically a part of that party. I think that's up for a fact finder to determine, but we want to make sure that all the parties are brought to justice. The portion of the video that I've seen on the news shows Aubrey going toward a white pickup, and it doesn't show anybody chasing him except for Brian doing the videotaping. And if it was a chase or whether it just happened to be that the, you know, it was a dash cam or whatever it was. Do you know how the video got leaked? I believe there was another attorney who was able to obtain the video and leaked it as well. There are different stories that I've been hearing on the ground of, they actually offered the video to the police of showing justification for their actions in the first place. So while we see the video where Mr. Ahmad is actually going forward and into a truck. There are other situations where there were other recounts of the two suspects, their stories change all the time. They drove in front of him. And as you can see in the video, the truck is at a, is veering left. So is they drove in front of him to deter him or get in front of him and cut him off. So he couldn't escape. And that's why they had confronted him and tried to keep him. And that's when the shots ensued. Right. What about Georgia stand your ground laws? Do they have any impact in this situation at all? Well, Georgia stand your ground laws basically in summary says there's no duty to retreat relating to use of force. So it matters on whose eyes you're looking into with this. And I don't know if you went through the whole the Barnhill letter. These individuals, again, getting in front, shouting at an individual while they had guns in a pickup truck at somebody who was not armed at all jumping out of the car to confront the individual. I'm sure, again, under Georgia Stand Your Ground law, there is no duty to retreat. So if you, in your all reasonableness, had thought that you were in danger, which I think anybody in that situation, regardless of your race, but especially a black man, would take that as a threatening gesture, could fight back without a duty to retreat. So 
I don't think that they can claim a stand your ground law at all. I think Mr. Ahmad, if he was still here, would be able to, though. Well, Chris, before we move on to our next segment, we're going to take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Predict legal outcomes with Blue Jay Legal's Foresight Platforms. Using AI to analyze thousands of cases and administrative rulings, Blue Jay Legal can predict with 90% accuracy on average how a judge would likely rule in your case. Plus, you can research by factors and outcomes to find the relevant cases in seconds. Stay ahead of the curve and learn more at bluejlegal.com. That's blue, the letter J, legal.com, bluejlegal.com. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm Craig Williams, and with us today is attorney Christopher Bruce, the political director for the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU of Georgia. We've been discussing the killing of Ahmad Aubrey, and right before the break, Chris, we were talking about the stand your ground laws. What are the circumstances that are going to happen with Mr. Bryant, the, the man who was... Uh, who took the video. Do you foresee any charges against him? The Georgia Bureau of Investigations has said there may be more arrests made within this case. And I, again, don't know if that deals with the way the police have handled the case, the way the district attorneys have happened, or even the individual who had invest, who had filmed the tape as well. I've seen his lawyer on TV talking about more. He was more of a witness than he is a suspect. There are some things, of course, that I have not uh, been privy to look at as far as uh, their investigation. But I think if there is any type of probable cause, this person should be arrested and arrested immediately. Do you see the uh, the DOJ weighing in over whether to file federal hate crime charges here? I implore the Department of Justice to look into this case. I think this is why the Department of Justice has happened. I'm familiar with the Shepherd Birds Hate Crimes Act. Because, and this goes into a personal story of mine, I'll make very brief. February 23rd is when the shooting happened, the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey. I remember that because on February 26th of 2012, it was the death of Trayvon Martin. And the reason, reason why I remember that is because I was a third year in law school reviewing, working for as an intern for Community Relations Service at the time. And I remember going to Sanford, Florida, and trying to mediate uh, the situations that were happening there. So it's very discouraging as a African-American male to know that I was doing something eight years ago, and I'm facing the exact same thing eight years later, with, again, another senseless killing of an African-American male. What does this do to race relations? I mean, where, where are we at this point? I, we haven't solved the problem that America has always dealt with. So you hear President Donald Trump talk about America's fighting an invisible enemy with the coronavirus and trying to find a cure or a vaccine, but America has never dealt with the original invisible enemy, which is white supremacy within the United States. We've been woefully disregarding a cure or vaccine in education or in love that we should be imploring with all Americans to stand up and fight out these biases that lead to situations like this. So unfortunately, this is a reminder, but we can't make it into a tragedy if we don't actually do something about it so it does not repeat. And that's the call that the ACLU of Georgia is doing. What do we do? Oh, man, there's there's so much to be done. I mean, reconciliations amongst individuals or just a calling out from the silent majority. And that's the problem. The silent majority of saying, we will not accept this type of behavior in our communities because we are Americans, all of us, regardless of our race, gender, or creed, we need to come together. So specifically, it's demanding that from your elected officials altogether. If you cannot criticize white supremacy and call it out for what it is, you do not need to represent that community. There are several other things of when actions like this happen taking to the streets and demanding that justice is done as well. It seems like we're, as you said, we're eight years away from it. And I can remember when hearing Martin Luther King's early speeches and it, it just seems like we're, it's a constant battle and it's so frustrating to see this again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee Georgia instituting a hate crime law out of this? Do you think that finally is going to get spurred to be done? I do, but let me tell you, I don't think that that justifies what happens here. 
So passing a hate crime statute is one thing. We need to make sure that we are tracking and having the policies in front of us to know where hate crimes exist so we can stamp it out altogether. That's why we're not opposing it. But let's go a little bit further. Let's amend Georgia's citizen's arrest statute so people do not feel empowered to follow other people and confront them. Let's change our use of force to that statute to make so make it so that people do not feel justified in confronting individuals and giving an overwhelming amount of force that leads to a deadly uh, confrontation, such as the same thing that we have with our stand your ground statute. Yeah, let's look a little bit into the future here with the McMichaels coming up. They'll certainly be facing trial at some point in the future. Do you think it's possible, given the video and the the current circumstances in Georgia, for them to get an impartial trial? Do you think they're Lawyers will be asking for a change of venue. Uh, That's an interesting dynamic that we've been discussing around the fourth prosecutor that has been put on this case. So to find a proper venue or anything else, I, I think that they need to face up to what has actually happened. I don't think this is being tried in the court of public opinion. There is a video. So that was going to be entered into evidence regardless. They deserve a fair trial and they need to be brought to justice. So I encourage, if it is a venue in the Glenn County or Brunswick area, I can't say I have a preference, but I know that the people in that community want to see justice. So I want them to be able to see it as well. I want them to be able to be in that courtroom every day of the trial so that that judge and that jury knows that they actually cared about this individual and they care about finally seeing justice in Brunswick and Glenn County. You mentioned the recently appointed prosecutor. What's your thoughts? So we've had concerns that there may be conflicts within our office. We've heard that their head homicide investigator knows one of the defendants, which clearly brings up a conflict of interest. We just call on the attorney general just to make sure that he's doing his job of overseeing this case and whatever prosecutor he puts in, that justice is done. What defenses do you anticipate the McMichaels offering in their trial? That is a great question because I don't see how you can literally put up a defense in this type of situation. Of course, they will come up with one, but using the second district attorney who recused himself, if you use his playbook, he will bring up the Georgia Citizen Statute, our use of force statute. Our open carry statute was saying that it was an assault for him to come up and um, have a gun when confronting an individual. And of course, the stand your ground statute. Right. Well, Chris, thank you so much. It looks like we've just about reached the end of our program. So I'd like to take this time to invite you to share your final thoughts along with your contact information for our listeners. Well, I just want to, again, thank you for bringing me on. I think that as much public opinion towards this we can actually get to a place where we can start solving this issue. I don't want this story to die off. People need to follow this and demand that justice is done all the way until the court case is finished. And then afterwards, making sure that there are clear perspectives on how to make change in Brunswick and Glenn County. So if you want to follow us, you can go to ACLUGA.org, Justice for Ahmad. And you can also follow us on our social media, which is ACLU of GA. Great. Well, thank you so much. And as we wrap up, we'd like to thank our guest, Attorney Chris Bruce, for joining us today from the Georgia ACLU. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Hey, it was great to be here. Thank you for doing this as well. Thank you. And for our listeners, if you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcasting app. You can also visit us at LegalTalkNetwork.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. When you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.